Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Reimagining Ritual and Style, New Conversations on African Art, a three-part series of online events hosted by the University of Iowa Stanley Museum of Art. I'm Corey Gunlock, Curator of African Arts at the Stanley Museum and moderator for our series this fall. I'm assisted tonight by my uh, two fellow museum colleagues, Curator of Special Projects, Derek Monroe, and Administrative Services Coordinator, Annette Niebuhr. Support for this event series has been provided through the Interdisciplinary Project for Advanced Study of Art and Life in Africa, commonly referred to as PASALA, hosted by University of Iowa's International Programs and funded by the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization. At our event on October 2nd, titled Rethinking the Canon, we heard from art historian Sylvester Ogbechi, Yael Biro, and Susan Gagliardi on the colonial complicity of the museum the beauty of African art and the birth of the marketplace for it in the West, and the importance of confronting and embracing ambiguity in scholarship on African art, ambiguous sources of information, ambiguous data, and the ambiguity of authority surrounding historical African art in the museum and online. The theme for this evening's event, New Directions in Practice and Performance, features presentations by Nana Okore and Dante Hayes, two artists for which the African collection at Iowa has served as an important source of inspiration, and Alan F. Roberts, um, whose career as a professor and curator is shaped in part by the same collection. As scholars of African art working in sculpture and anthropology, Nena, Dante, and Al have at various points in time over the last few decades engaged with the African collection at the Stanley Museum in order to do their work. And in each case, the results have been transformative. Through Nana's material practices, Dante's handling of symbolic forms, and Al's career-long focus on the art of blacksmithing in Africa and the African diaspora, transformation arises as a common theme in which to view and discuss new directions in artistic practice and performance this evening, and, use, and as a useful context in which to reimagine and rethink ritual and style in the arts of global Africa. As the Stanley Museum of Art plans to reopen a new facility after 14 years of displacement, presentations tonight continue to set a critical tone for this vision as we venture into a new era for African art in Iowa. Presentations that begin this evening with artist Dante Hayes, followed by Alan F. Roberts, distinguished professor emeritus in the Department of World Arts and Cultures and Dance at UCLA, and end with Nena Okore, artist and professor of art at North Park University in Chicago, assistant chief examiner and associate lecturer in the Department of Art Education at Monash University, Melbourne, Australia. Each speaker will present for 20 minutes, after which the panelists will join me in a 15 minute roundtable discussion. Afterwards, Derek Monroe will open the Q&A box for the public to submit questions for an additional 15 minute session with panelists. We'll go ahead and begin with Dante. Dante K. Hayes graduated summa cum laude from the Kennesaw State University at Kennesaw, Georgia with a BFA in ceramics and printmaking with an art history minor. He received his MA and MFA with honors from the University of Iowa and is the 2017 recipient of the University of Iowa Arts Fellowship. Recent art exhibitions include group shows at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, Illinois, the Trout Museum of Art, Appleton, Wisconsin, and the 2021 Atlanta Biennial at the Atlanta Contemporary in Georgia. Dante's artwork has been presented at the, the 154 Art Fair, London, England, Design Miami, Florida, and a solo presentation at the 2021 Armory Art Fair, New York City. His work is included in permanent collections, of the Renwick Gallery, Smithsonian Museum of American Art, Washington, DC, the Gibbs Museum of Art, Charleston, South Carolina, and the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston, Texas, to name a few. Hayes is, uh, Hayes is a 2019 Ceramics Monthly Magazine Emerging Artists and Art Access Fellow. He is the 2019 winner of the 1858 Prize for Contemporary Southern Art from Gibbs Museum of Art, and is represented by Mindy Solomon Gallery in Miami, Florida. Please join me in welcoming Dante Hayes. Take it away, Dante. Thanks, Corey. And I'm looking forward to um, conversating with Alan and Nena during the uh, round table. So let's begin with the, you know, in the share screen.
So as we start this whole conversation, I wanted to um, call this talk uh, Future Ancestors because I call this talk that because the things that we do, the things that we create and destroy is what the, our descendants will judge us by in the um, later times when we're no longer here. So with that, I wanted to show a little bit about how I do my process. Um, I do a lot of different mediums, but primarily I, uh, my research has been working in ceramics. And um, the powerful thing about that is in traditional uh, ceramics in uh, West Africa, mainly in, uh, in, in Ghana, I always think about the women. The women are the ones who are making the pots traditionally. However, of course, you know, this is, I'm a contemporary artist. I'm a part of the African diaspora and we create and um, make new traditions. But I will always like to bring how I learned how to create work through the idea of coil methods and, and hand building and, and using the pit fire, just like in traditional um, works. This piece here is something that I like to start with, especially since we're talking about reimagining something. And in my work, I always think about how things are seen and perceived. So when I saw on this image, the first thing I think about when I think of a headdress, I think of the womb, thinking a head coming out of a womb. And if we really want to reimagine rituals and reimagine how we think about the African diaspora and African art, we must sometimes have to also think the opportunity to make new. Um, and the only way we can do that is by possibly starting all over again. So this piece here is a ceramic piece that I created um, last year and it's called Womb. And it's speaking to the idea of truly transformation and the idea that we can transform things, um, may it be as artists, as individuals, but also we're speaking even globally um, to the things that are happening with African art and the African diaspora in the museums. So from that, let's begin about like where I come up with these ideas. You know, I see myself as a futurist. Um, growing up, there was never, you never saw that many um, artists of color on TV or, or in movies. And you, so the first thing that I always think of is Star Trek Next Generation. That was when I actually saw black people in the future. It made me think about like the idea of like black people were not going nowhere and their culture will still be here. Um, growing up in Atlanta, of course, I love hip hop and Outkast has always been my number one like um, group. And when I was younger, before I even thought I was gonna be an artist, I would do posters for the different um, rappers and that would come into town and I would do their posters and things. So that's how I kind of started to get into art and then eventually into ceramics. Um, and lastly, my interest in art history and history in general. And, um, and it always goes back to the idea of the middle passage. So a lot of my work speaks on that. When, you, when I was younger, you never like even um, were told like most of the people on those ships were most likely from West Africa. They were just like saying they were Africans. I mean, that's a, that's a continent, that's not a country. So, so you know what I mean? So somebody who lives in Atlanta and like hearing that, I'm like, I wanna know where we go, we were from. I wanna know who I am and what, um, and how to express, express that. So I feel like now that I'm older, I kind of see that my work is really speaking about what is a home. Um, growing up in the South, you see a lot of um, motifs of a pineapple. And when I was younger, we, after church, we would go to people's homes for, you know, the nice potluck. And one time we were going to uh, a friend's um, um, home from church and I didn't know that they had a lot of money. And so we were there like, oh, wow, man, this house is a mansion. And my mom was like, yeah, it's gonna be great. We're gonna get some good fried chicken. We're gonna have some collard greens. It's gonna be great in there. We'll open the door. There was a big pineapple in the front and it was like a gold, it looked gold, but of course it was just like brass. And I was like, why is there a pineapple there? And my mom was like, oh, it's a symbol for welcoming and hospitality, not knowing really where it came from. First of all, pineapples are a plant. They are not from Hawaii. Like most people always think that pineapples are from Hawaii. They are not from Hawaii. It's actually, they're from South America. That's where they began in like um, Peru and, uh, and um, Brazil. And um, so why do I bring that up? Because when coming from 
um, a diverse place like in Atlanta and then moving in 2017 for grad school at the University of Iowa, I was like an Afronaut, that's what I called myself. The only black person everywhere I went, I always had to be the welcoming person because everyone tried to welcome me in weird ways. So I always like went back to think about what does pineapple and welcoming really mean? So during my research, um, during my time at Iowa, I started to realize that first, pineapples um, are not from Hawaii. Hawaiians never heard of a pineapple until the 1880s. Actually, they were cultivated, like I said, in South America from the indigenous people there, and they moved it to the Caribbean, and many of them traded back and forth, using it as food, as money, as um, ways for even beer and rituals. So why do I have the information of King Charles II here? It's because he was called King Pine. And many of the enslaved Africans that were on those ships coming from um, West Africa, they would stop in South America. They would stop in the Caribbean. Then they would stop in um, North America. And they were the ones that would help cultivate those pineapples. Now, the crazy thing is, now we're going to know how we got this idea of welcoming rituals. And this is the reason why I'm speaking about this in this um, talk about how we have rituals. The ritual of getting the idea of welcoming actually came from a crazy um, way. When new shipments of enslaved Africans would arrive to the new world, and so all of a sudden they're at the dock, the foreman would run out and bring a pineapple and put it on a big spike to let everyone know a new shipment of enslaved Africans had arrived. And that's how we got the idea of welcoming. This is crazy. So it's colonial. It just has nothing to do with anything about Hawaii or anything else. So it's actually a colonial idea. So now let's bring this all together. Why do I bring this up? It's because I wanted to um, talk about how we, rituals are created and thought of. Like we thought that that ritual of a pineapple was from Hawaii, first of all, because of the Dole Pineapple Company, you know, and things of that nature. So what are the different rituals when those who are on those ships, may they've been from Nigeria or Ghana or the Ivory Coast, you know? So once again, that made me think of home and the domiciles using like the, the raffia and things of that nature really made me think of like, wow, that is rituals because if you saw those things in those spaces, you would know what it meant. So if you saw this, this plank mask, you would know exactly what's happening. You would know about the fiber on the costume. So those are the things that I was interested in, using that as a way to um, push the idea of ritual for the welcoming ritual. Just like if we were going to go to a game at the University of Iowa, everyone's wearing black and yellow. You, you automatically know that's the color of the Hawkeyes. You say Hawkeyes, everyone knows it's Iowa. You know, it's the same kind of thing. You would just know that's the traditions, correct? So from there, I was also thinking about like seeing that and then the opposite, the colonial um, clothing. What would that be? What does that represent? The only people that could even have a pineapple were those who were in the aristocrats. Only the rich could actually um, have the ritual welcoming someone to their home. And those who were not nobles and who were just the um, bourgeois, they used teapots that were um, symbolized with a pineapple because only rich people could actually be welcoming according to the colonial. And as we know, we don't even know that now. So lastly, in the work, I'm speaking about the idea of the waves, the waves in hair, the, the waves in water, the waves in the music I listen to when I create the work. These are all rituals as well. The way that we um, put our hair together, the way that we walk, the way that we talk. Um, and I took this idea because even though I've never been to Africa, our DNA is what, in our hair, is what creates this idea that I am from that space. You know, so I'm always a part of something, even though I've never been there. But also it made me think of even something even grander too, the idea of all these connections becoming one. So from that, when I'm creating the work, kind of see these as like three-dimensional prints because how I create the um, pieces, I get into like a ritual 
in myself, just like an Aboriginal dream painting. Each mark becomes a new a move, and I become into time and space. Past, present, and future are all one. They're not um, different. They're all in the same time period. So from there, I created this piece called Zigzag. And if you had looked at that plank um, mask from the walk, you would notice that a lot of the symbolism of zigzags and, and, the, and black and white, the reason why all these pieces that I create, most of them are black because of the firing process. The clay that I actually use actually is the reason why it's black. There is no glaze on the um, pieces. So similar to like how in Ghana, they, in traditional, they would have a pit firing. You know, instead, I'm not pit firing these pieces. I'm actually using the clay body that can, once it's fired to a certain amount of temp, it creates this color. So I'm creating a ritual into the piece, a new string to the piece, a new vision of the piece to become one with something that you did not know. Um, this piece is called Tassel. And this is something new that I've actually made here. I'm currently a um, resident at the Beeman Center in Omaha, Nebraska. And, um, and I was thinking a lot about like the rituals of how do we welcome someone now, especially we're wearing a mask and things of that nature, you know, or those who don't want to wear a mask, is that wel non-welcoming, you know, or not getting the vaccination, is that a consider a welcoming, you know? So all these things are playing a part in the work contemporarily, but also thinking back to the past of like, if you wore this certain thing, you knew exactly you were initiated to something. I'm trying to get people to initiate it into being welcoming. And I'm not just talking about one-on-one -on -one welcoming. I'm talking about welcoming that is more than that. I'm talking about the idea of preserving who you are, but also pushing something forward to change museums, change institutions and, and change um, way of life. Too many people during this time, for instance, this piece here is called Remix. And I was thinking about the movement of the dance when, when you would have the initiation, you know? So now let's go formally. If you notice, there's a bunch of bulbous shapes. So this comes back to my science fiction nerdy um, years. You know, this here is a Dalek. And for those who don't know, that's from the BBC Doctor Who. And he was like, exterminate, exterminate, exterminate. And these people that would come through time and space um, and um, different um, worlds to destroy those who they thought that were not um, as smart or deserving. And I kind of felt like that's how it, it feels like sometimes to be a person of color, but also the idea of how people choose what is in a museum who, and, and what's not in a museum and how those things are also played into parts and rituals. So I created this piece called the Dalek. So if you can see that the bulbous shapes also mimicking the same bulbous shapes that you would have saw on a Dalek. So it's like pushing that the opposite to like destroying those things that we thought we knew. From here, this piece is here is called double consciousness. And that's what I think about, I kind of consider this like a, a self-portrait in a lot of ways, because living in, in this society, you feel like you're in two worlds, you know? As a black man, I'm, I, I have a lot of privilege. I was able to get two master degrees, you know? And then friends of mine who, who are not, who sometimes are back and forth being homeless to being in an apartment and things in that, in that world. So it's like the idea of just the double consciousness of how we live and how we choose to have these new imaginations of, of life. From here, this piece here is called Withstand. And I was thinking about how we stand, you know, upright and tall and strong when you're feeling, you know, empowered. But it also speaks to the idea of like the arch. And what do you do when you go through an arch? You go through a new portal. And I kind of see like this is the opportunity to go to the future again, to withstand all those things in the past and not um, let those things take from you, you know, learn from those things and grow from it. So all those things that I just said, yeah, that's great. But, you know, what happened during 2020, you know, Breonna Taylor died, George Floyd died. And so something made me think back to the Middle Passage. When I would go to museums and you know how museums are, 
probably soon we're going to be seeing that great uh, Stanley Museum and everything goes well, then somehow it takes you into the gift shop. And in the gift shop, you always see coral. You know, I don't know why, but they always have coral in the gift shops. <laughs> and I thought coral was white, but actually coral that's white, that means it's dead. So that started making me just think of the idea of those that were on those um, ships in the, in the Atlantic that were um, pushed overboard for any of those reasons. And now their life is no longer breathing of brightness. Now they are just white, just like the coral. So I created this piece and it's in porcelain. So it's a complete opposite from the black um, stoneware work. And I called this speak because why is it the only time um, you listen to someone that's black is through trauma? This is when you wanna speak and it kind of speaks to the idea of the black and white checkered board that's on those planes. The idea of ignorance versus um, not knowledge, chaos over um, 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 normalcy. So here, where is our sanctuary? The idea of like for um, black and brown people, where, where do they go to um, feel calm and feel um, safe? So I created this piece. Once again, it kind of reminds me of the waves in hair, um, the waves in the, the costumes of the fiber during the movement of the dance, but it also speak, looks like a breastplate. And sometimes you have to protect yourself in rituals when you're trying to welcome someone and be vulnerable at the same time. This piece here is called Prepare. And once again, this is an idea that I got watching my favorite movie. One of the best movies ever was Star Trek, I mean, uh, Star Wars and um, Empire Strikes Back. Everyone knows those newer movies, but Empire Strikes Back was the best Star Wars movie. I don't care what anyone says, that was definitely the best. And in the beginning of it, Dark Raider is looking all over the galaxy, looking for um, Luke Skywalker. So there's different droids moving all over the galaxy looking for him. So I kind of thought that it was an idea of like preparing, you know? So I created this piece in the concept of the droid. Black people was a droid as in the future. And the idea of in preparing a way in a space to welcome new rituals, we must create that space. We must prepare that space. It just can't be, oh yeah, we're gonna do a symposium, Corey. Yeah, thanks, Corey, I'm gonna be a part of that. No, this is not something that you just write, stop Asian hate, stop Black Lives Matter. This is something that, this is a continual thing. This is not after a year, we disappear and we don't know what we're talking about. You know, so this is, I'm excited that I'm a part of this because we're preparing something new and changing how we see um, artists um, from, the traditional artists to the to the contemporary artists and how we choose those artists in museums. This piece here is called Loaf. And I wanted to um, pretty much conclude in this piece for my conversation. And when I create my um, pieces, I always think about the form. And if you notice, the form looks like a loaf of bread. Let's keep it real, it does, right? But it also, the way that the, uh, the lines going side to side, it also looks like they're weaved together. And I call it loaf because what do you do when you break bread? The idea of breaking bread. We're breaking bread right now. When we have our round table, we'll be able to break bread together and talk about ways to continually change these rituals that we see in um, art, as well as we see in institutions, as well as we see as human beings. So that's the reason why I wanted to end with this piece because this is an idea to continue the conversation but not continue conversations only. It's time to also act, acknowledge things that were done wrong, take things and change those things that we see that are wrong. Don't try to um, make excuses, just say it was wrong. Let's readdress that and do it right and be accountable and say, if I'm not accountable, create building blocks to make those accountabilities if we really want to create something better and reimagining something that's a new ritual. And with that, I want to say thank you. And I'm looking forward to listening to Al and Nina and then having the roundtable discussion.
Thank you so much, Dante, for that extraordinary presentation. You're a powerful artist, and it's an honor to have you here tonight. I'll never forget when I met you in person, the day I defended my dissertation. And yeah. it's, it's good to still be with you today and to see your work develop over the past couple of years. Yeah, thanks, um, thank you again. I'd like to turn our attention now um, to our next speaker, Al Roberts. Um, who I've known for some time now um, in terms of uh, our work on the Art and Life in Africa website, uh, for which Al was an original contributor and um, worked with me as I re-edited that website years ago. Um, Al Roberts is a scholar of African visual and performing, uh, performance arts trained in sociocultural anthropology. After positions at the University of Michigan and Albion College, Al held joint appointments at the University of Iowa from 1988 to 1999 in the Department of Anthropology and the African-American World Studies Program. <clears throat> His late spouse, Mary Kajowski Roberts, was director of the Stanley Museum from 1988 until her untimely death from cancer in 1990. During their first months at Iowa, Mary and Al worked with the late U of I Africanist art history professor, Chris Roy, who passed away in 2019 to found Pasala, based at the Stanley Museum. Through substantial support from the Stanley Foundation of Muscatine, Iowa, early Pasala initiatives included graduate scholarships to now notable scholars, postdoctoral and senior fellowships, Stanley conferences on African arts, and support for research and exhibition development at the Stanley Museum. Al is now distinguished professor emeritus of world arts and cultures at U UCLA having retired this past summer. He remains co-editor and a co-editor of the peer-reviewed journal African Arts. He and his late wife, Mary Rapali, as many know, knew her, Nuda Roberts, which passed away in 2018, undertook research, writing, and teaching, and museum exhibition development together. Polly taught several African art history graduate seminars at Iowa from 1995 to 1999, when she and Elle moved to UCLA. The book accompanying their NEH funded traveling exhibition, Memory, Luba Art and the Making of History, 1996, won the College Art Association's Alfred H. Barr Award for Outstanding Museum Scholarship, while A Saint in the City, Sufi Arts of Urban Senegal, was honored with the African Studies Association's Herskovitz Prize as the best African studies volume of 2003. Please join me in welcoming Al Roberts. Take it away, Al. Well, thank you very much, Corey. And uh, I would like to thank you and Lauren Lessing and other friends at the Stanley Museum and elsewhere at the University of Iowa for bringing me home. I was just in Iowa City for a long week uh, because my son and daughter-in-law uh, live there and I do find the great pleasure of feeling that Iowa City is a home, especially uh, as I made two different trips to Prairie Lights and saw that the world uh, was okay after all. So uh, what I'd like to do is just um, kind of walk us through uh, some ideas <clears throat> in memory of both uh, my deceased wives and uh, really begin with, um, Lonnie Holly, a remarkable uh, African-American sculptor and improv musician uh, about whom there was a wonderful uh, write-up in the New York Times uh, in uh, early May that some of you may have seen, written by uh, <clears throat> someone named Yinka uh, Eljoba. And the piece, the piece, the piece was called uh, An Artist's Life of Perseverance. Lonnie Holly's evo evocative works are often created from salvaged materials, and uh, this becomes an immediate issue of poignancy. Uh, Lonnie Holly was born in 1950 as the seventh of his mother's 27 children, and his growing up was difficult indeed, and a poignant revelation has led to his current practice, as he has put it in this article. I had been thrown away as a child, and here I was building something out of unwanted things, the uh, kind of salvage materials that he uses. 
as he has discovered art as service to others, as he puts it, he asserts that I want to, I want that when all of these, all my works are presented, people can say, oh, that Lonnie, he took it all. His hands took the spirit, the things don't want us to have, the things they don't want us to have, and boom, he brought it all together. Holly is also an accomplished improvisational, improvisational musician and in reflecting upon his art making, he holds that it's about the brain. Same brain that produces music produces visual art. I call it brain smithing. While to my knowledge, Holly does not explain his remarkable neologism further, its evocations beg for contemplation. To me, brain smithing suggests purpose creativity, finding value in what others dismiss or scorn, and above all, it implies inspired processes that invoke spirit, that is. Holly holds that the furious curiosity, here's some more of his work, the furious curiosity that uh, he manifests in his work uh, made, from created, created from found materials responds to the oldest tradition of African-American sculpture. And one must assume that African influences are so implied. While the term brainsmithing may resonate with brainstorming, I certainly prefer, prefer uh, brainsmithing uh, having lived in Iowa for 11 years and reflecting on what storms can do to that neck of the woods. Uh, brainsmithing is something that uh, comes from Lonnie Holly's fusing scrap material and other detritus. And one has to imagine that brainsmithing is his riff on blacksmithing. Undoubtedly, with added nuance, should the black be black written with a capital B. And then uh, what I'd like to do then is just to talk a little bit about a recent exhibition and book program that was sponsored by the Fowler Museum of African Art about blacksmithing, because I think it does really sort of lend itself to uh, what I will then get to with regard to some Senegalese contemporary artists who I feel are brainsmiths. I think that there's just a way that uh, there's a resonance between how uh, Lonnie Holly enunciates his uh, kind of work and practice as brainsmithing and what three different artists that I'll uh, introduce uh, very briefly at the end of the talk uh, do as well. So the thing about, brain, about uh, striking iron and brainsmithing and blacksmithing is that you have to think first of all how people obtained iron in the old days. And this is one of those things, uh, thinking of what Dante was just presenting to us uh, and you know, his emphasis on ceramics, which is clay, which is the earth, the earth where ancestors' feet have trod and one thing and are buried. You know, there's just lots and lots of resonances that are important here. Uh, when archeologists have studied iron production across Africa and specifically iron smelting, in other words, taking ore and you know, reducing just regular old rock to usable iron, it is really astounding how the, the technologies were independently invented in several different parts of the African continent. Uh, that was also uh, a set of practices that were certainly influenced by international trade, but the technologies were local. And what's so remarkable about it, and this again takes me to Dante's talk about uh, ceramics and clay, is that uh, observational sciences were at play. Uh, if you look at the picture on the left, this is uh, a picture from the south uh, eastern shores of Lake Tanganyika in Central Africa, a, a group of people called Pipa, who were very, very famous uh, blacksmiths and smelters, and who created, as did people on the other side, on the Congolese side of Lake Tanganyika, they were able to smelt iron that early European visitors deemed to be the equivalent of Swedish iron uh, uh, being produced. It was one of the mainstays of the Industrial Revolution. Not only that, they were able to produce steel. And so just an astounding technology when you think that the smelting furnace on the left and on the right are sculpted from earth 
but not just any old dirt, because the fact is that people using their observational sciences understood that certain kinds of soil could resist the remarkable heat that was necessary to smelt iron. And let me just tell you how remarkable I find this. I literally just can't get my head around the fact that it, within the confines of a smelting furnace like this, in order to smelt iron, one has to raise the temperature inside a furnace to 2300 degrees Fahrenheit and control that heat through the use of very clever positioning of different kinds of firewood and one thing or another. And you notice down at the bottom, there are these uh, holes in the bottom. These are two air, there were bellows that were put in there to, to raise the temperature through uh, increased oxygenation. But the fact is that uh, this is just astounding to me. And in order to create a furnace that could resist that kind of heat, people went to the source of soil available in termite mounds. So this is too complex a story to get into here, but it's observational sciences. People knew their environment very, very intimately. And they knew that if you took the clay that had already been chewed up by termites, probably changed chemically in the process, certainly endowed with nitrogen more than most dirt <clears throat> because of uh, the interior landscapes of termitaries. <clears throat> the fact is that that dirt could be crafted into furnaces that would in fact resist the heat. And so not only making iron, but making steel is just a quite remarkable thing. When the European colonizers came into the picture, one of the first things they did was to outlaw iron smelting and other local technologies that might permit Africans to live independently when the whole point of colonial hegemony was to uh, oblige people to sell their labor to create a capitalist market. And so many different aspects of social life were lost, but one is called sympoesis. And if you look at these two pictures of ongoing iron smelting in a few very particular corners of Africa, this happens to be in Rwanda, and uh, look at how these men are working together. And this particular, this is a secondary smelt. So this has already been smelted once. This is how uh, the original bloomery iron, as it's called, would be uh, reduced to steel. And they're having a good time. Each one of these men has his own functions, his own skills that he brings to bear and one thing or another as seen in the other picture as well. But the fact is that uh, this is working together and joining together to produce things that are of great utility and value and spiritual importance. So when the colonial persons took over and prevented people from smelting iron, they also destroyed a particular opportunity for people to work together like this. This is one of those things that is just a sad legacy of colonialism. But what's important to what we want to talk about here with regard to brainsmithing is that despite the kind of colonial actions, the histories of iron and even iron these days that's obtained from scrap and forged uh, into tools and, and uh, whatever by today's blacksmiths, Iron as a material bears these long histories. And so when you see that in Africa, uh, in pre-colonial times, iron currency tokens were used for all sorts of exchanges, the value of iron is based on its wisdom, as I'll say, uh, explain in just a couple minutes, what all these histories bring to it. So here are several pictures of, uh, that were taken in Burkina Faso by Chris Roy, as were, was the great picture of uh, Bois plank masks that uh, Dante showed. Chris was a wonderful photographer and I was really happy uh, that uh, I could borrow some of his photographs for the striking iron book. And the fact is that blacksmiths create all sorts of useful things. These are uh, hoe blades, 
Blacksmiths then take the blades that they forge and often half them with wooden handles, sell them in marketplaces, and then craft particular things. And so here's the toolkit of someone who's making masks. You'll see down here. And over on the right is, uh, I don't know if you can see this picture because I'm not able to see it, but uh, if you can, uh, there's a gentleman named uh, Raogo San, San, Salvadogo that uh, Chris photographed in 1976 using an ads that was forged locally to make a very complex and beautiful mask. So this is where the forging, the blacksmithing comes into play. Blacksmiths are brainsmiths. They use all those qualities that I mentioned to make things that are both useful, but also uh, spiritually beautiful. When I mentioned the word wisdom, I'm referring specifically to uh, uh, a, a coining of terms by Alison Saar, a wonderful uh, sculptor who lives here in Los Angeles, uh, and her mother is still with us, thank God. Uh, Betty Saar, who is quite elderly now, but finally getting uh, lots and lots of uh, acknowledgement across the country. In 2000, the year after my late wife Polly and I moved from Iowa to UCLA, Holly was deputy director of the Fowler Museum at UCLA, and she and Allison put together a very interesting exhibition called Body Politics. And it was a comparison of Allison's work, like you see here. And then uh, the lower work is a beautiful uh, Luba. Uh, it's actually a drinking cup, uh, kind of upside down. So the open part of it is down, which it wouldn't be ordinarily. But uh, Luba arts were studied by Polly for her dissertation research and are the basis of lots of projects that we had over the years. What's remarkable though, is to look at this, this um, bust here by Alison Saar. It's called Chaos in the Kitchen. And Dante mentioned uh, the hair of people of African descent as being significant. You see this picture uh, of Alison herself with a large figure that uh, she's put at Scripps College. Now, this one here is called Chaos in the Kitchen because if you know about African-American hair and if you know what happens to sort of the hair on the back of your neck, it's called the kitchen. It gets really messed up in little kids. It's hard to comb out if you're a mom or dad. And so Chaos in the Kitchen is the tangle. But then what Allison has done is to embed different memory objects in here because for Allison, hair is a mnemonic opportunity. It's a way to stimulate memory. And so there are hopes and dreams through objects that she's kind of buried and hidden in the hair here that come to play. But what's important about uh, brainsmithing and the wisdom of materials is that the skin that she has put on this figure is actually made from ceiling tin that she found put out to the curb in Harlem, New York, when she had an artist's residency there uh, as a young person. And it was the time when a lot of the old brownstones were being bought up by bougie people and uh, torn down to the studs and rebuilt. And so things that uh, were features of the Victorian houses like ceiling tin were just taken down and thrown away. Ceiling tin was embossed with patterns, a little bit like wallpaper, but uh, made out of tin and it was put on the ceiling. And so in the course of conversations between Polly and Allison about putting together juxtaposing these arts that Allison makes and the Uba people made of Central Africa. Allison came up with the idea of wisdom because the materials themselves have wisdom, meaning that that ceiling tin looked down on everyday life in the homes where it graced the ceiling. And all the things that happened there, all the happy events, all the arguments, all the lovemaking, all the feasting, everything else happened under the ceiling. And so, you know, kind of was seen by the ceiling tin that then the wisdom of that material is what she uses for skin on her figures 
because first of all, it reminds her of uh, earlier African scarification patterns, but it also is that these figures are living with memory and are endowed with all these different stories of how the material was made and brought to use first and then repurposed by somebody like Allison or like uh, Lonnie Holly. So the three uh, artists I'd like to introduce very briefly start with Musa Tin. And uh, you'll see him here. He, uh, this was a fairly early picture taken uh, in the late 90s. So I hope he still looks like that, but you know, I don't look like I looked when I was in the 1990s, so probably he doesn't either. Anyway, the point is that Musa is a very, very interesting artist. He makes things uh, of various sorts from repurposed materials. And in particular, what has caught my attention and that Polly and I uh, really featured in our Saint in the City exhibition that Corey mentioned are these figures made from metal that are then superimposed on a painted background. So this is a canvas and then these stand out from the canvas. And there's a whole bunch of different references here. Uh, these figures are in fact dancing. This is a Sufi movement that uh, Musa Teen belongs to called the Murids. And this piece of art here is in fact reflecting on his own sense of uh, solidarity and uh, ritual practices among Murid uh, Sufis in Senegal. But the remarkable thing is that he doesn't just take any old metal to make these figures. He specifically finds mufflers that have been discarded because they've got a hole in them or whatever like that. And he chooses that metal. And so all of these pieces of metal are muffler metal. And his explanation is that, well, you know, I want metal that has had the opportunity to take the heat. So the word opportunity refers to a kind of Sufi sense of materials that are in fact vibrant. There's a uh, vitality to materials. And so uh, in mystical practices through Sufism, people honor the material, artists honor the materials that they work with by permitting the materials to show what they got. So if this metal has taken the heat, that's what M Musa wants to convey in the figures that he creates from the metal because life in Senegal is not easy. It's a hot place to live. It's hard to work out in the hot sun. You gotta take the heat to figure out a way to feed your family. And so this is where Musa brainsmiths by really thinking through what he uses and how he uses it and why he uses it at all. Needless to say, someone coming into a gallery and seeing this work and not knowing any of that might still find it attractive and still might wanna buy it and think of it with regard to other idioms, other paradigms of Euro European uh, modernism or whatever. That's fine. Musa has done well selling his work. But the fact is for Musa himself and then anyone who knows the idioms of uh, Senegalese mysticism, it means way, way more than anything superficial. It has hidden senses. This is also true of the second artist, V.A. Diba. V.A. also, this is an early picture of him too. I should put up a picture of me when I was that age and you'll see that none of us look the same. Anyway, the point is that uh, VA is a very remarkable uh, artist whose work has been recognized and is in major collections around the world, several here in the United States. And what he has done is to take locally woven strip cloth. So this is woven and <clears throat> in the old days, it would be used for making uh, clothing and whatever. These days it's still made, but mostly used for shrouds. And so he takes that and he paints it but then he stretches it and he stresses it and he abrades it with sand and he mix it, mixes sand into paint and you know, kind of pulls and twists and whatever. Again, because he wants to permit the materials to talk. He wants the materials to prove what they have. He wants to be in a kind of conversation and union with his own materials 
so that art making is way more than art making. And this is the brainsmithing part of it. This is how Lonnie Holly says that, you know, he's hoping at the end, people will see that uh, he has basically worked in the spirit of the things that he's producing. So VA makes paintings like this. He hides things in pockets as though these were the pockets of a robe. He often hangs suspended uh, things here because it's the weight of earth. It's pulling down of people so their feet are on the ground so that they do tangible work. This other, this work up in the uh, right hand corner <clears throat> is called Mater music, um, what is it called? Uh, musical materiality. And again, he's taken uh, recycled wood and wrapped it with cloth that he's painted in one thing or another. This is uh, like a balafon, like a marimba. You know, this is kind of the notes that would be played, but played in a very local idiom. It's kind of subtle and implicit that this is a musical piece that's made material. And then down here is a picture, is a uh, work that's much more recent called Water Faucets. It's made out of uh, paper cutouts in the shape of water faucets. And this uh, results from VA being very put out by the fact that there are so many different items that are imported into Senegal these days from a variety of places, but especially China, that are ripoffs. They don't work. You can go and buy a water faucet because you need one and you take it home and it doesn't work. So you go back and you get another water faucet and you bring it home and that one doesn't work either. And you can go on and on and on and on. And so some of these uh, pictures, a series of these have hundreds of water faucets because sooner or later you might get one that'll work. This is Hope Springs Eternal. The last artist uh, I'd like to present is uh, Dari Lowe who passed away uh, several years back and just an amazing guy in his own right. Here on the uh, left-hand corner is Ndari <clears throat> explaining to Polly and me that you can make something out of anything. And so he just picked up an old broken down kerosene lamp that he had found someplace and put in a pile because he might not have thought what he could do with it yet, but it has potential to make something interesting and meaningful uh, with the materials in hand. <clears throat> and again, that's the wisdom, the wisdom of all the use, the, <clears throat> the light that was shed, the things that were read by that light, the ways that people use lights to, uh, you know, kind of illuminate their homes during all kinds of activities in the evening. That's what he's talking about here. But then what he is, is principally known for are figures that he made out of repurposed recycled rebar. And so Senegal and especially Dakar has been seeing a, you know, a very kind of rapid increase in building and infrastructural uh, projects, again, funded a lot by the Chinese and other people. And so rebar uh, can be found that's already been used and has been taken out of a construction site. It's taken down to uh, replace it with something else. So Dari, began making these walking figures and made out of rebar and purposefully in motion, always on the go. And then he started making these other figures that are just very, very moving. Uh, and he clustered them in a part of his house that was basically in his yard just to sort of put them someplace. But when one had the privilege of visiting that part of his house and seeing these things all put together. Uh, it was quite extraordinary to tell, you, to tell you the truth. And I'm not sure if you can see the picture on the right, but there's a figure uh, praying and beseeching with hands raised like this. Very, very uh, remarkable figures. And he was somebody that specifically himself articulated, but then Senegalese art critics and reporters have uh, written extensively about how Ndari made his religion material. He used recycled materials to, to really sort of th think through and realize what was important to him in life. So just to, to finish then, uh, I know that uh, Corey and I have talked about uh, a wonderful uh, Senegalese philosopher named Suleiman Bashir Ndeng, 
Jing, uh, who is at Columbia. And one of the things that he says is that, uh, you know, life is always on the move. The world is continuously making itself. That human being is not a state, but a task. And so this is what brainsmithing is about, uh, as far as I understand Lonnie Holly's words, or at least as I can extend them into other films in uh, African practice. Thank you very much. And I do, just to put in a little thing here, I do have a paper. If anyone is interested, you'd be welcome to send me an email and I can send you a copy of uh, a draft of a paper that uh, takes these ideas together. Thank you. Thank you, Al, for that fantastic presentation. Um, I think you're absolutely right that brainsmithing um, is a more appropriate term to use in context where we normally use the word brainstorming. And I think the artists that you uh, presented today are, are excellent examples of that, that process. Um, I'd like to turn our attention now to our next speaker, Nena Okore. Um, Nena Okore is an artist, researcher, teacher who uses artic artistic practice, pedagogy, and social engagements to address ecological issues. As an internationally acclaimed art practitioner, Okore has been involved in numerous participatory art projects and exhibitions designed to produce dialogue, art making, and an awareness of current environmental issues. Working largely with eco-based materials, Okore use, uses food-based bioplastic materials to create delicate works of art that engender dialogue about waste reduction and sustainable practices in art making. Okore has a BA from the University of Nigeria and Suka and an MA and MFA from the University of Iowa. Added to numerous national and international awards, Okore is a recipient of the 2012 Fulbright Scholar Award and Creative Victoria Award from Australia. Her works have been featured in major exhibitions at the Museum of Art and Design, New York, Museum of Contemporary African Diasporic Art, New York, Spelman Museum of Fine Art, Atlanta, Museo Afro Brazil, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Memphis Brooks Museum of Art, and the Cleveland Museum of Art, among others. Okore is currently part of the 2021 Bruges Triennial Exhibition, Belgium, and the Chengdu International Biennial in China. Please welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming Nana Okore. Take it away, Nana. Thank you, Corey. Thank you for that um, wonderful um, introduction. Uh, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here today with um, these two wonderful co-panelists. And uh, it's a pleasure to be back to Iowa, um, virtually. <laughs> and uh, yes, I'm very thrilled to be here tonight. Um, to begin, I'd just like to say that um, Dolmite works have uh, traversed many influences and themes. I'm coming to it, um, or I, I want to try to distill the discussion around my practice um, through an autho-ethnographic um, voice as an African, as a teacher, and as an eco um, enthusiast. So um, as, many as, uh, as many of you know, I grew up um, in Nigeria from the early 80s until 2000s when I moved to the United States. And um, because I was born to um, academic parents, I was particularly um, exposed to a life of exploration. They, they were very excited about allowing me to um, explore and navigate the landscape um, in the university town where I grew up at Nsuka in Nigeria. And they tried to raise us in, a, in an Igbo way. Igbo is my, um, my heritage and my cultural background. And uh, because of that, we always found ourselves in our um, hometown, in the local and uh, rural um, homestead, um, where we would, you know, encounter a lot of um, the local environment. And um, that kind of engagement uh, really exposed me to uh, many traditional artifacts like masks and woven fabric and figurines. And um, particularly my grandmother, who was um, a person of, of her, of uh, a craftsperson, if you will, um, also had a huge influence in me. Um, she was 
known in her community as someone who uh, was a, a, a household maker. Um, she, she made mats and little um, crafts and cooking utensils. And all of that um, is to say that she was instrumental to shaping my own creative sensibilities. And on account of these early exposures to the sub in a rural life, both in Nsuka and in my hometown, Ututu, I gained uh, a rich um, sensibility to the interconnectedness of the social and physical world. And um, when I would wrap myself in the beautiful raffia mats that my grandmother made, um, or chase um, masquerades um, running around in the, in the um, village stead, I gained a tacit knowledge about um, what it meant to become with the environment or become with the art. So in my mind, art and life were intersected. They were not separate. And I think that that was something that I, I gained a, a proper understanding from um, encountering uh, late Chris Roy, who was also uh, a very wonderful historian um, at, at the museum uh, in Iowa, at the University of Iowa, sorry. And um, he, he really helped me to understand what it meant to say that art is life and life is art. And so it's important um, to, to kind of note these experiences because everything I do as an artist and as a teacher and a scholar is uh, entrenched or enmeshed in these um, sort of like ways of living. Um, this is how I understand the world. This is how I learn. And this is what informs my creative practice. So in the next few slides, I will attempt to interweave these different components of my personhood um, by speaking to the ideas of call and response in some of my works and I'm talking about how my role as a teacher and a researcher informs my creative process. So this piece is called Nkata and this was created in 2015. Um, in this piece, I was very much interested in aggregating different visual elements that not only reminded me of the natural canopies from trees in the environments that I grew up as a child, but also embodied this vibrant um, reverberation of uh, the rural setting. And um, in, in the background of this piece, um, there is, there is a, a sound of narratives going on in the Igbo language and the English language as well. And um, there was also uh, a video component of this piece where there were some abstract um, forms kind of like playing uh, casts or, or projected on the floor. And because I grew up seeing and having the jute material around me all the time, it, jute material is such a, a ubiquitous uh, material. Um, it was one of the materials that I naturally gravitated towards once I uh, graduated from, from um, from the master's program at the University of Iowa. Um, I was drawn to it because it reminded me of an embodiment of, of uh, passage of time, of history, of people. And um, I started to use this to create really large scale sculptures and uh, works of art. And so um, I'm, in terms of like the material, I'm drawn to the, the tactility, the versatility, the smells, the sort of aura that it presents and sort of how it's related to uh, reuse and function and sort of the ritual of um, becoming and changing its form each time it goes from one place to the other and, and becoming um, very transformable. And um, though I don't necessarily uh, represent uh, in this slide um, the idea of how the burlap kind of translates. Um, one key element that uh, makes my work different from a lot of other artists is that um, I, I try to encourage human engagement in my materials uh, through touch. And so audiences are usually encouraged to feel, to smell, uh, to kind of meander with the work and get to know the work a little better. Okay, so in the next installation, um, this work speaks metaphorically to the idea of call and response. Um, and it's called Share Audacity. Um, it reaches up high into the atrium, um, about 24 feet tall. And the piece invites viewers to engage with it between 
the first and the second floors of that building. And like the piece before it, Chair Audacity has um, elemental sounds of wind, rain, and, and waves. And it, um, it, it keeps playing in the space. So it kind of creates a, an ambient and interspatial aura um, between the giant red columns and the, the uh, interwoven tapestry above. And the viewers can stand beneath it and feel kind of shrouded in it. And even as I work um, in the, with the form, uh, even as I worked with it, it, it was kind of interesting how the piece was also consuming my shape and absorbing me into it. And it made me really rest, you know, think about the idea that I had mentioned earlier, which is this idea that um, art and life are one. And um, as I was making it, I was sort of feeling the energy of the piece and I felt like I was part of it, that that experience had to be a key factor in how the piece was shaped and formed. So it wasn't like I was making it and that's it. And um, in, in that process, I was having conversations with the piece too, because a lot of the components for this piece were not ready-made. It was all kind of formed and shaped within the site. It was made in situ. And so um, that was something that I found myself engaging in this conversation back and forth between um, the materials and myself and the space. And so there was this call and response happening. And I kept thinking about um, this idea and the notion that art should not be separate from the artist or the viewer, that there should be um, some kind of um, uh, strings of consciousness that kind of pass through all the different participants and co-participants. And this piece I called Anonymofu, and it basically is a uh, polyptych installation created from newspapers. Um, the word Anonymofu or the phrase actually uh, directly translates uh, from Igbo to English as four in one. And basically I was just responding to the idea of my Igbo culture where we have a four day week instead of a seven day week in, in the calendar and the weekly calendar. And um, I was really interested in reflecting on the passage of time and how it plays into the experience of people's lives. And in the Igbo cosmology, for instance, time is usually condensed into phases. And so phases was at the back of my mind, phases like morning, afternoon, night, phases like birth, childhood, manhood, death. Um, additionally, I was um, speaking to the idea that as time matures, we get to understand the natural environment, the environment where we exist, and we become really attuned to the earth. So it was important. It was a call for you know, people to, to, be, to realize the environments, to sort of be aware of their spaces and see how um, one element, one mat form of matter can actually um, transfer or traverse to another experience in, in the same space. And so I was hoping that in this piece, people would become more attuned with their surroundings uh, through the piece by experiencing the obstructive presence of these pieces and at the same time, um, noticing how sort of permeable and accessible it is. So the piece um, here is a, was a community project that I created during um, a teaching residency at Skidmore College in 2011. And the piece was, um, I was really interested in getting people together to engage in the process of making um, making space or making um, forms with very mundane uh, ordinary materials. And th these fabrics were basically uh, farm burlap and used paper, like old paper that was sourced from um, the, the, the surroundings. And it was interesting um, to bring members of the public together, to work on this piece, to dialogue about what unites us as humans, um, to kind of break down the boundaries or the barriers between us and reflect on our collective experiences. We chose the color red here specifically because it symbolizes the idea of the blood that runs through us as a shared humanity. Emissary uh, is the title of this piece and it was really uh, just a kind of playful uh, representation um, of these materials in an attempt to sort of like suggest the figurative forms that are messengers um, of ecological warning. Um, this piece reminds me um, of it, it, they look, they kind of have a bodily presence because they're about 
um, some of them are seven feet um, tall and some are nine, some are 10. So they have like this uh, presence in the space. And I was really um, just you know, thinking about how a revivified, um, recycled and repurposed materials um, can create knowledge and how even using such delicate material and fragile material can help us, you know, tap into the, um, the, the fragile state of our, our planet and things like that. So it's, it's sort of more, it's more metaphorical than um, representational, but I really wanted to use this piece to kind of suggest that the materials are calling out, they're sounding the alarms, they're speaking to us and we need to kind of pay attention to these uh, problems that we're, are, are kind of facing us and our children and the generations to come, the environmental crisis. And so again, looking back at my childhood and um, the kind of encounters that uh, I, I experienced with, you know, meeting masquerades um, that were collectively viewed by the locals as agents of the higher forces. I tried to kind of embody this other bodily, bodily experience or um, through this piece called the, the Fringes and Fragments. And um, I especially wanted people to come up close to them and to witness their energy, um, like there were bodies. And as these, as people kind of walked around these pieces and through the spaces, um, the pieces themselves were also equally responding. So it was again, like a call and response kind of thing. Um, uh, the pieces started to slightly move and swirl in, in the space. And that was kind of very enticing and exciting to see how that um, uh, animation uh, was enlivened. Um, in this piece on land and beyond, it's a similar kind of engagement uh, that I try to enliven here. Uh, the viewers were welcome to walk between the handmade paper, um, the bows, the uh, masses of jute rope that was assembled on the floor. And um, above, of course, there was the undulating um, suspended forms that were floating like aquatic objects in space. And between the uh, floating objects and the forms that were at the, on the floor, people were encouraged to pick things up, to smell them, to move through the forms and to respond to them. For me, it is so key and important that my work invites those kinds of participation because what I want is not for people to kind of view the work and appreciate it from a distance. I want that there to be a kind of connection, a kind of resonance that you can only get when you touch or feel or smell or be in the presence of these works. And so uh, it was very important for me to have people um, walking through these pieces and really touching and engaging them. Unleashed is another piece that I created from discarded newspapers, and it's about 10 feet tall and 20 feet wide, so it's quite tiring. And the idea behind this piece was to, uh, again, provoke the audience to think about the implications of waste um, and how those implications affect and spread into other kinds of bioenvironments or biosystems. Um, part of my goal in making uh, the piece, um, this large, was first to kind of make it unquestionably visible to whomever was in the space. And second, to bring a focus to bear on the material, the material presence of the piece. I wanted people to see that these things are paper and question how did how did we how did we get to amass all of this paper? And this was something I collected from the recycle center. You know, I just went in and collected a bunch of paper and started working with them to create this large piece. And so it really speaks to this idea of consumerism. It really speaks to the idea that um, there is so much uh, mindlessness or maybe lack of thought around the, the global implication of the kinds of waste that we're producing and there needs to be sort of like a reflection. So I was really hoping to trigger some kind of uh, deep reflection or considerations about these issues. And similar to the previous piece on Licht, this piece that I called Ututu represents um, or rather presents a viewer with a tactile environment that is again um, 
oscillating with energy, with raw materiality, with color from the burlap and the handmade paper and the strings and all of that like thing power that comes when we think about the African essence of call and response, the, the, the realization that um, things around us carry energy. Those are the kinds of things that I'm really interested in. And um, these materials are all kind of combined to evoke this uh, motion or uh, the movement of the sense of being um, in a sheltered way. And um, like some of the other works I showed earlier, this, works also, this work also speaks to uh, the transformative potential of materials that I have sourced from my surroundings. And like the one before, the piece does a good job of um, engaging audience. Uh, through visual um, engagement and also through sensorial um, encounter. So again, with this piece, um, I, I had invited people to, to touch, to add, to uh, move things around uh, and sort of really engage with it. And I think it does end up having a lot of impact on people that um, get to, to, work, to, to, to see these works and experience them. Um, so now I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of um, pivot a little bit and talk about uh, my current uh, material practice because as an artist, teacher, and uh, researcher, um, and, or what um, Stephanie Springray, the autographer, likes to, to refer to as autography, A R T, artist, researcher, and teacher. Um, I've been really thinking lately a lot about my process and what my materials are doing and how they're impacting my art or, or what kind of impact my art is making, I should say. And um, it has recently occurred to me that in the last couple of years that my art has been doing a lot of problematizing issues, visualizing issues, aestheticizing the issues of ecological uh, waste and sort of like drawing attention to it, inviting people's interaction. But in my mind, I, don't, I didn't feel like it was doing enough. It wasn't really creating or being part of the solution to the ecological problem. And so I had to step back and ask myself, you know, how can I be part of that solution? What can I do to be helping to not just visualize the problem, problematize it, the issues with my art by engaging immersive environments, but also um, how can I be a part of the reduction of energy usage, the reduction of waste in contemporary art practice, for instance, because that's one thing that we kind of like shy away from in the contemporary art world. Um, we don't talk about the material use. We don't talk about how we amass so much that goes to the landfill, whether it's in the use of plaster or the use of um, raw materials, which, I'm not necessarily um, finger pointing or saying that it's wrong, but how much how much investment are we putting into recontextualizing and rethinking these materials and how we can actually cut down by using more natural sources or using um, less permanent materials? So um, based on this, I started um, thinking about my own um, footprint, carbon footprint, and how I can reduce production of waste um, and not just um, do that by speaking about it and raising my voice, but also acting on it. Um, so to make those changes uh, really meaningful, I started creating um, and making what I call bioplastic materials uh, from my food waste. And these food waste include fruit and vegetable waste as a way of actually contributing to the solution of the waste and energy problem. And um, I'm <laughs> thinking uh, in making these, I, I, I was drawing on the African materialist approach um, because it does promote the need to recognize the agentic force of other things around us in a way that is respectful and reciprocal, uh, including the energy forces of non-humans and spiritual forces. So um, those kinds of things were at the back of my mind. I kept thinking, if I'm going to be an ecological um, activist or somebody who is really speaking my words and living the, the you know by my words and I have to really think about how do I respect the environment how do I create respectfully and be an acknowledgement of the forces that are at play in the world that we live in so I started working with these bioplastic ideas and um, my bioplastic pr practice seeks to engender dialogue 
among other things, about the ecological emergencies that we face there. And what a great way to drive conversation by creating a space that is generative, that is also degenerative in this process with the bioplastic because it breaks down. These are not permanent structures. And the art world has a habit of encouraging um, brand new ideas that are pushing the boundaries of synthetic and uh, artificial materials and also things that would last forever. Meanwhile, the earth is very uh, ephemeral, it's very temporary, and we need to be thinking more about how we can have an immediacy around the way that we experience art. And art should, we should give permission to art also to degenerate. Many of the, uh, um, the, the canonical um, works from the African art collection in the museum are all made from very um, earthy natural materials and they've, they've stood the test of time. So why can't we look back at these things and see how we can also use some of the lessons from those to kind of impress upon the art that we make uh, in a way that we can enjoy them, we can interact with them, but they don't have to last forever. So in this new series, I'm creating um, work from bioplastic and I'm using cheesecloth. I'm trying to at least use biodegradable materials that are painted with the cheesecloth um, material or paste. And I'm making ephemeral work that has the capacity to be composted and returned to the earth should it be become waste or should it we decide that we don't want it anymore. And I'm also open to the idea that it could it could um, decay in the process, and that's fine. Um, so here are a few of the examples of uh, this process that I have been exploring of recent, um, whereby I'm using like the plastic to create like sheets that I'm cutting out to make material for my art. And I think that there's so much potential here uh, for making art very safely uh, with the bioplastic material. And I'm committed to working uh, on these ideas and engendering more conversations and uh, trying to create an awareness about um, these issues in a way that is, like I said earlier, meaningful. Um, so th that's that's sort of where I am now. And um, I I'd like to invite people to, to think along with me and to, to ask questions about this, if there are any. And I'd just like to leave you, as I started off with um, an image of the work that I recently created um, called And the World Keeps Turning. And it is also in connection with this idea of um, how, we, how we live our lives today and how it might affect the future generations. And this work is currently in the uh, Bruges International Trinelli um, exhibition in Belgium. So again, thank you. Thank you very much, Nana, for that wonderful presentation. And I particularly enjoy the, the power of transformation and your use of materials. And I think that that focus on transformation is what unites the, the three panelists we have here tonight. And so I'd like to transition into a roundtable discussion with the three of you. Um, and specifically, I'd like to bring in a, a keynote that has been recent, recently released by um, the steering committee for the Biennial of Contemporary African Art scheduled to be held next year at Dakar, Senegal. Um, the Ndafa Out of Fire is the title of the keynote for that biennial exhibition. And in Surer language spoken by many people, but not all, in Senegal and the Gambia, Ndafa means quote unquote to forge as a transformation of physical matter. Forging applies equally in the keynote as a way in which the biennial of contemporary African art seeks to transform, to iron out imbalances, reinvent models, and revise our protocols at a time when, quote, the world is cowering behind its identities and particularisms. Our series this fall, Reimagining Ritual and Style, New Conversations on African Art, complements these aims as it examines standards of practice or in other words, our rituals, as you've all mentioned, in and beyond the museum. As scholars working in sculpture in the study of blacksmiths and brainsmiths in global Africa, I'd like to hear more about how your work operates in this kind of context. What sort of challenges and opportunities are involved for you now? And how do you envision your work in the future? So I, I open the floor to discussion. Um, on this, and um, this this is obviously something that you've touched upon in your 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 presentations, and 
um, again, I, I'd like to take it back to this idea of your current focus on transformation, Al, you, your, your, your career long focus on blacksmithing to me demonstrates that interest. And as I mentioned in the introduction, Dante, your work, the power of transforming symbolic forms, both in terms of historic references and science fiction, um, that, that sort of transformation is, is absolutely clear. And with Nena, your use of materials and the transformative process there, I think resonates with this interest in forging and transforming um, by re-envisioning our place in the world as scholars, whether we work in text or, or materials, whether they're clay or, or fiber. Um, how can we think more broadly in terms of the crises that we face, as you mentioned, Nena, in terms of ecological crisis, Dante, um, in terms of social justice and the, the lack of, of equity among institutions representing artists of color, in particular um, African-American artists, as you've mentioned today, both you and Al. Um, I'd like to hear more from you on this particular topic. Well, for myself, I, um, just thinking about the opportunity and the equity that we can get, you know, from even starting this conversation. Um, going forward, since you were bringing up, like, how do you see your work being able to push this forward? I, I was hoping to create a space that I could use the, um, these objects to become actually like wisdom that Al and Nina were referring to and creating a space for those who do not have access to um, be in that space too. So like an idea of going back to what we're doing right now, um, breaking bread, having food, using the idea of an object as a, a placeholder holder, just because my work is in ceramics and it, it could be functional as well. So creating a space that those who do not have can eat. So a project that I would like to work on was one to create uh, like a Louis the 14th like table and everyone is open to come and sit at the table, eat food. Like, you know, I love me some fried chicken. Come on now, you know what I'm saying? Collard greens, you know, cornbread and each, um, plate will be actually from like antiques that I will get and I will refire those with my own um, interpretations on each plate and everything that is sold will go right back to the community to help the community so bring you know so I'm not getting nothing from this I'm bringing back to the community by eating as well as providing um, money to sustain themselves one thing I've noticed about your work, Dante and Nena, is uh, the vision that you have involves direct participation with your work physically in terms of interaction. And I think it's worth pointing out that historically and conventionally, there's no opportunity for that in a museum context where you bring in artists whose works are at the forefront of supporting a mission um, that you nevertheless need to <laughs> refrain from physically. And so, you know, I bring this up as a challenge um, for myself as a curator in hosting works like this. This idea of call and response and physical interaction seems like um, a very uh, successful means of, of confronting these issues that you raise. And um, I, I'm hoping that museums will embrace that and use it as a way to um, provide solutions to the ideas that you're engaging, um, the problems in particular. Um, Al, would you like to, to contribute? You know, I would like to just sort of <clears throat> think a little bit about what Dante was just talking about in his last uh, project that he outlined a little bit. <clears throat> before we got started, uh, when we were just sort of chatting before the event began and all that sort of thing, we were talking about the uh, we we're talking about food, actually, <laughs> and I like to eat. And uh, since you chose your thematic uh, word from Senegal and especially the Dakar uh, Biennale, 
One of the things, Dante, that uh, came to mind when you were talking about your project is um, that word that I introduced that I think could be uh, taken for other runs, sympoesis, because when you go to Senegal, which I hope all of us will, and if you've been there before, you know this um, Senegalese cuisine, and I'm sure Igbo cuisine is really great too. This is not to get into Fudo nationalism or whatever. But Senegalese food is just absolutely, in my mind, fabulous and the best I've ever had. And one of the national dishes sort of stands for the whole practice of commensality, of eating together. It's called chebujen, and you get a big kind of clatter, and people sit around it, and people eat from the same plate. And people share, you know, people will, uh, you only eat with your right hand. And so people will reach in and help you pull apart a piece of chicken or will, if you're an honored guest, uh, as I've been, uh, you know, really graced with that possibility over and over, people will reach in and put little things from the middle of the plate, which is where the fish and other kind of uh, best parts are, they'll distribute and put them around and make sure that actually you don't eat all that habanero pepper at once because you won't want to. And so just take a little and that'll be helpful. Help. And, you know, people are using their hand to eat. And then when there's somebody who is awkward using a hand to eat little teeny uh, grain like me, I'll give you a spoon. So the thing is that, uh, you know, the eating together part of it is really uh, important to me uh, as a way of really sort of escaping the kind of everybody eats their own plate sort of uh, perspective that I understand as kind of Eurocentric. We all share that in this country, but, um, you know, there's just something to be gained from that sort of commensality, eating together like that. And that makes me think also of uh, something that I kind of, brought to mind uh, when Nena was talking, because uh, I've been reading a lot of sort of theoretical literature these days on decolonization, and there's you know, good vocabulary to be gotten from people like Walter Mignolo. And one of the things that he talks about is he, he draws a heuristic distinction between aesthetics, which is a kind of top-down colonial way of this is what is beautiful, and if you don't subscribe to it, you're a nothing artist, you're not even an artist, you're a craftsperson, this, that, and the other thing, right? He posits a difference between aesthetics, this top-down, and aesthesis, which is a kind of horizontal sharing. And I would say that that's like call and response. You know, it's not as though Igbo and other societies, especially along the West African coast, haven't had, you know, sort of vertical uh, social differences with kingdoms in one thing or another, and nobility among some and not among all. But the call and response idiom, I think, is fundamentally decolonial <clears throat> because it is this kind of sharing and back and forth thing and eating together out of one plate and helping each other pull apart the chicken because you can't do that very easily with one hand. I got hold of this part, you hold that part, and we both pull at the same time. You know, that's call and response eating. So, you know, I just think that there are some really wonderful resonances uh, between your two presentations that, uh, you know, we can kind of take forward because these are creative processes. And both of you are making art that is so evocative and compelling, but also so purposeful, you know, and both of you are thinking about spiritual sides of things, but specifically for reasons, social justice or ecological justice or whatever like that. So that's where I've been thinking through these, through these talks. For me, um, that, that word decolonization is at the heart of um, the, the idea of transformation because um, Africa was uh, transformed into something that it, it can't really recognize anymore. And um, when I listen to all the presentations, I see, um, I see so many uh, ingenious elements that 
uh, the continent possesses, including community, including um, the, like you talked about, the, the blacksmithing culture of working as a group, as a community, uh, including the, the craftsmanship of making the ingenuity of creating metal and all of that with clay and all of that. We have so much, Africa has so much to offer. And right now, I think the transformation should be no longer from the West to Africa, but now from Africa to the West. We have a lot on our platter to give. And uh, the West has always, the imperialist, uh, imperialistic view has always framed uh, things through the Western lens in a way that makes every other thing, um, you know, devoid of, of, of meaning or of value. And now we're, we're beginning to have a voice. Africa is beginning to have a voice and to present the things that are of value to us, to the world. And the world needs to take a cue from us or from Africa because uh, even, if the, even the idea of new materialism, um, where does it come from? The, the animism is, is a, is a the new materialism is a knockoff of animism, for instance, African animism, because it's been there. The, the use of material and the ingenuity around how material has been transformed has always been with African, the African culture and um, it's uh, the African aesthetics. And so we need to, we need to take a lesson from uh, the African page and sort of like um, begin to use that in, as a way to frame um, certain, um, new new cultural ways of of um, repairing <laughs> the damage that colonialism has brought because I think that it's a big loss um, to to the world that we have kind of shut out so much knowledge and lessons and information from a continent that is filled with a lot of rich ideas and rich resources. I think that's a very eloquent way of of responding and in terms of your work. Um, functioning as a, a form of repair. And the whole idea of, of reparation has a much broader context in terms of the ethics surrounding objects in museum collections. And um, I see that uh, dovetailing quite well. Um, I wanna make sure that we make time for our audience um, to pose questions as well. And so um, I believe we have a couple here that, um, I'd like to share with the group, if you don't mind. Um, so we have a couple questions here. Um, one from uh, Rachel Cobbler Woolert, a question for both artists, uh, Dante and Nena. What is your experience, if any, uh, having uh, with having work in an institutional space where you are the one person representing blackness, similar to being the only black person in the room or the opposite where your work may be minimalized in terms of how it relates to black experience. Experience is plural. This question comes from recently reading Cobana Mercer's article, Black Art and the Burden of Representation. Um, if you'd care to respond, um, there's, a, there's another question as well. I, I would say that um, I'm black, I'm African and I'm proud. And um, in all the times that I've had to uh, represent my works in um, non-African institutions or in environments where I stand out, um, I have always tried to uh, rise above that um, to kind of present something fresh and different in a way that would uh, enlighten people about the, the, the humanity that we share the collective experiences that we share and not necessarily our differences. It's about what bridges us more than what separates us. And so I, I try not to, of course it's there, you know, but I try not to have that at the center of the conversation or to make, to have that as a distraction. Um, it, it is about for me empowering and strengthening what exists and not kind of picking holes. But I know that those holes exist and I know that those problems are there, but I'm always about trying to repair and to um, rise above it. And maybe maybe because, and I, and I completely acknowledge um, the, the experiences of those who have been hurt by deeply and scarred uh, generations into generations from the colonial experience. And it, it's a very, very different feeling for people who have gone through that, for the, the Black nation that has gone through that um, experience. I didn't go through it, so I'm completely sensitive to it. But I think that, you know, as an artist who uh, comes from a continent where I have, I've always uh, felt empowered 
it is uh, less of a, uh, it, it doesn't draw me down as much, I should say. Thank you. Yeah, great question. First of all, for myself, you know, I'm proud and black it ain't gonna change. And like I said before, black people are gonna be here in the future. We started this. So I never even think about that. Corey knows, you know, I, I keep it real um, 100 when I was at Iowa, you know, so anybody there already knows about me there. So, <laughs> but, but to um, address the idea of encouragement, you know, make your work. This is your work. You don't have to worry about what they're, what other people are saying, critiquing, because they don't know, you know, saying so do your work. When I was at the University of Iowa, there was plenty of people who were like telling me I should be doing this, I should be doing that. You know, and then now they're coming to me on, on, on Instagram saying, how can I be down with you? You know what I mean? So let, let Africa speak, you know, and that's what I try to do with my work, you know, especially someone from the African diaspora. I know what it feels like to be in a space, especially like I were coming from Atlanta, you know, I saw plenty of people, all different kind of people, but then I am the black person, you know what I mean? the black guy, whatever they want to give, I never worried about that because I knew who I was. And once you feel that, you can do what you want to do. So be encouraged by that to make your work. Thank you, Dante. We have um, a question from one of our, our future panelists, Vanetta Jules Rosette, uh, professor of sociology at UC San Diego. Her question is for Nena. Um, Nana, how do you see the position of contemporary African women artists in the nexus of contemporary African art? What are some of the special and particular challenges faced by women artists? Thank you for that question. Um, <laughs> I, I think it, this is a, a very important question that is dear to my heart because um, I, above and beyond being black, I'm also a woman. <laughs> color. And um, I've had uh, many occasions where I tend to be also, I also tend to stand out. So I'm not just standing out as a Black person, I'm also standing out as a woman, an African woman, like I am here, <laughs> by the way. But um, I think that the struggles are very real and um, many steps have been made to kind of close the gap uh, that, especially in the last maybe 30 years, I grew up not knowing a single um, modern or contemporary artist. So I had no role models when I was growing up. Um, my people, I had, I had women um, artists around me like my grandmother and the, the local women uh, who were doing different forms of craft and art, um, art and craft, but they weren't um, in a position to guide me uh, in my artistic practice. And so I think that, that African women have come a very long way, um, have tried to situate themselves, especially through African feminism, uh, to give themselves, a, to, to bring a voice and to kind of promote things that are important to, to break down those barriers, but we still have some ways to go. Um, as an African woman, I continue to try to, to, to give a voice and also to inspire other young ladies. I'm always looking for opportunities to encourage young uh, women who are in the field, who are struggling, who are trying to find a voice uh, by you know, supporting them financially, through mentoring and through other means you know, of, of giving them an avenue to, to share their voice. So I'm, I'm very encouraged by <laughs> the way that things ha are shaping on the continent, but I think that there is still some ways to go because um, the support system is, qu is not quite there yet. Um, there, there isn't enough uh, structure within uh, the economic system, within the um, the, the social structures to help, you know, nurture women, female artists. So there's still a lot of pressures on them to take on other uh, society-driven, um, you know, re responsibilities, if you will. And so, I, yeah, I think I think that's a, a very it's a very good question. It's broad, but um, I I'm very optimistic, and I I think that there uh, there's a lot of work still to be done. Thank you, Nana. I also have a very um, logistical question from one of our audience members who would like to know um, what the material is for your work for in one. Oh, 
Yes, that is a newspaper, just newspaper, newspaper. and uh, coated with uh, acrylic paint. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, we have uh, one more question. Um, actually, it looks like more of a comment from um, Dossier de Bindute, uh, who just is, is mentioning, thank you for your work in Africa. The museums are not so developed like in America. I wanna know how is the level of the interest of African-American to African in the museums in America? Hmm. So a, a comparative um, question here between, if I understand correctly, I, I think that sort of question would require um, a, a statistical analysis to see perhaps the attendance for exhibitions of those kinds among museums. Um, but I, you know, this is a question for the group, but as a curator, that's probably where I would begin if, if attendance numbers are um, a measure of, of that interest. But at the same time, I know that scholarship um, and word of mouth and social media now is just as legitimate and important for, for measuring interest. Um, I open the, the discussion to you as well. Yeah, I, th I think that there there isn't a way to gauge um, how much collection um, has happened between the African Americans and Africans, especially female artists, because um, <laughs> it's yeah. I, I think that Corey is completely right um, that it need we need an expert or some kind of data analysis to understand that. But one thing I would say is that I know that. Um, recently um, many African names are now being uh, promoted and collected uh, viciously, especially among the female artists. We're now hearing names like um, uh, Wenga Chi, uh, what's her name? Um, Mutu, Chi, Mutu. Mm -hmm. uh, Njideka Apinyeli Crosby um, and, and a host of others. And so we are, we are gaining some grounds. I, um, I don't have a lot of knowledge about this. I'm not in a position to answer that question, but I, I think that there, there are some movement happening overall. Um, it looks like uh, we have um, a hand raised by um, Lauren, my director, which I'm attempting to promote so that she can um, comment as well, if this works. But I think, Al, were you about to speak? I was just going to put in a word uh, because the uh, previous, the last question uh, did mention museums, and um, it's been a problem uh, that is being approached and uh, kind of worked through uh, and has been for a long time. And I think there's been some very significant progress. Uh, when you introduced me, you mentioned uh, my late wife. Mary Kujowski Roberts, who was uh, director of the uh, University of Iowa Museum for a while. And before we moved to Iowa City, we were in Ann Arbor and we had an African National Museums project that we did. And the idea was that, that she was trained as a museum educator uh, primarily. And so we wanted to work with uh, African muse museums in Africa uh, on education issues and whatever. And the problem that was very obvious was that the museums that existed uh, were created in the colonial period for colonial audiences that specifically excluded African visitors. You know, they were segregated. And so people then inherited these museums that had that kind of a, uh, you know, unfortunate legacy. And so what we discovered quite readily was that uh, people were very anxious to do something, but the museums didn't seem like the place to do it. They wanted uh, people, you know, teachers and whatever, wanted to learn from cultural activities and earlier arts and whatever, but uh, the museums just seemed moribund. And so that has changed. And there are just wonderful examples of how that has and is changing across the African continent, actually. I can think of examples that I know of in Ghana and Senegal and Nigeria and over on the east coast of Africa, where people are creating their own museums, uh, often from scratch, because the point is that let's do it our way and let's have what we want and 
what we want in there and have the activities that we feel will be, you know, good for our school kids and one thing or another like that. So, you know, there is a kind of give and take and those of us who are mostly based in the United States or somewhere outside of the African continent, I think can specifically do some good work uh, trying to collaborate with museum uh, colleagues on the continent to try to find ways that um, we could work, like Dana was saying, work across our differences and find out ways that pedagogy and you know, conservation, there are all kinds of practical issues in museums that uh, are technologies and whatever. That's something that can be shared, but it's more really kind of developing an ethos of that kind of uh, call and response sort of uh, activity that, you know, is the sort of basic idiom of an institution like a museum, especially in a lot of African circumstances. Thank you, Al. Um, Lauren, I think you should be able to speak if you'd like to join the conversation. Um, hold on, let me see if I, can everyone hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, good, <laughs> wonderful. I'm having a little bit of uh, connectivity problem from the east side of Iowa City, which is not an unusual um, issue here. Uh, but I, I just want to uh, thank all of you for those really uh, thoughtful answers. And I would say that, you know, thinking about um, African and African American collections in museums is, for me, you know, only one part of a much larger issue, which really has to do with audience, that art museums in the United States um, are all struggling now. Um, you know, I think COVID-19 has made the inequalities that are sort of baked into uh, high institutions in, in our country clearer than they were. We're struggling to expand our audience, you know, and to find ways to really welcome people to museums to, to see the art that we have, to be um, participants in conversations about it. And, um, you know, as we prepare to open the new Stanley next September, this is, you know, very much on my mind, you know, what kinds of programs, activities, exhibitions, outreach should we be doing to, you know, to really reach a broader cross section of our audience than we're reaching now. So I don't, that's, it just sort of dovetails with some of the things that you were saying, and it, it, but it's off to the side also. Thank you, Lauren. Um, thinking about that, the best way of doing that is going first outside of the museum, going where people that look like me are at. You need to go where they are. You don't assume that people are just gonna go because you have an artist of color showing at your museum. You know, you still got to go on where the people are. You need to yeah. get outside of the museum, you know, and go to those um, places and spaces where they walk in and talk, you know, and then that's how you bring people in. Then they'll be like, oh, this is what's going on. I'm down with that. But you, you can't, you guys can't assume that people are going to just um, go to the museum because a Black artist is in there. Exactly. <laughs> Dante, very smart. <laughs> right on. Yeah. Outreach. Yes. Um, thank and it's not you. like no. just for one show either. Mm -hmm. I just want to show because, like, and also piggies back something that Nena was saying about when the question on how how do you um, deal with being the person of color in space? You know, mm -hmm. um, this is not something that you just do. You know, once a month. This is an everyday thing. You know, right. this is not, so like the symposium shouldn't be just oh we did this and then we won't do another one until five years later. Yeah, you know what I mean? Right. There's something about that we we continually talk about even after the symposium, like every month there's something about this or something to continue mm -hmm. the conversation because it won't become a conversation anymore. It'll become doing. Mm -hmm. it, it'll become doing, yep. not conversating. That's that's great advice, Dante. Thank you. Yeah. Right. I, you know, I, I think okay. Yeah, I just want to add that it's it, it like Dante said, it's about building community and that community has to be across the two sides, where even if you're outreaching to these communities, it's about starting at the grassroots to bring children from these communities into the museum and having them 
experience being in this space and know that, yes, it is a possibility that there is something like this because many young children from African-American communities don't have an experience of even visiting art institutions. And so it's a foreign thing to them. And uh, they, you know, it, it makes it harder to build that kind of audience uh, that we're kind of trying to um, uh, nurture. And yeah, so I completely agree that there has to be that community building across the two sides. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Nana. Thank you all. Um, we're nearing a two hour mark. And so I think we should probably bring this to a close. Thank you so much, Dante, Al, Nana, to everyone that's joined us tonight. And um, again, another big thanks to Pasala for their support of this evening's event. Um, as programs at the Stanley Museum continue a focus on African art this fall, I hope to see you all again for our third and final session titled Museum Interventions. Same time, 7 p.m. on Thursday, on November 11th, with Benetta Jules Rosette, J.R. Osborne, and Peju Laiyubola. Thank you again. Have a wonderful evening, and hope to see you next time. Bye. Thanks, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you, Dante. This was wonderful.